quick announcement today, just before I start on the book. I'm not on Twitter anymore. My account still exists, but I won't be able to access it. Long story. I'll start a new account sometime and let you know, but not this week. Anyway, on with the book. Today we're looking at Chapter 4, Taxes and Corporations. Like with a lot of this book, you can see where he's coming from, but I have a lot of historical and philosophical objections to what he says. I'm not an expert on this history, but like most standard accounts of history, this one leaves key trends out and paints something of an incomplete picture that I'm hoping to fill in. I remember in school being told the story of Robin Hood and his merry men. My teacher thought it was a wonderful story of a romantic hero who robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. My rich dad didn't see Robin Hood as a hero. He called Robin Hood a crook. Okay, so I've got all kinds of questions to, to start with. I mean, first, you, you got taught Robin Hood in school? Were you taught it as history or some kind of parable? That's one of those weird things. And you have a teacher who who thought he was great. That's okay. I mean, I'm not really surprised, but I would think a lot of teachers would kind of agree with, with your rich dad that, like, he was just a crook. I think you could, if you could just kind of um, nail them down to details they would probably end up siding with the sheriffs and the bailiffs or whatever they were called back then. Because, you know, you could say like, oh, so you don't actually believe in the law or something like that. And most people will be like, oh, but I do believe in the law. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, teachers, there's only so much that they can teach beyond the curriculum um, and, and inject their own opinions into things. Like, it's... Like, nowadays, they might even get censured for it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, of course your dad saw Robin Hood as a crook. I mean, he is a crook. He's a thief. But the problem is whether you see that as good or not. I'm okay with thievery. I'm just fine with it, personally. As long as, like, it's actually being used to alleviate poverty or, or, or uh, you know, liberate somebody somehow. Um, I made a whole video uh, that you can watch on the Trailer Park Boys, and it outlines this whole philosophy, uh, if you want to check that out. Um, there, but there's some, there's some problems with his analysis of Robin Hood. He's going to try to connect it to the government, which it really isn't. So let's read. Robin Hood may be long gone, but his followers live on. I often hear people say, why don't the rich pay for it? Or, the rich should pay more in taxes and give it to the poor. Okay, but that's not Robin Hood, okay? That's not what Robin Hood was advocating. He didn't say, let's try to make the rich pay for it, for, for something, for like infrastructure or something like that. That's not Robin Hood. That's not his story. That's not his lesson. Is he a crook, or is he trying to go through the legal means to do something? <laughs> like, which is it? No, he robbed the rich at, what's it called, arrow point, bow point, whatever, whatever gun point would be back then. Um, like, there's, a, there's quite a big difference. For one thing, doing it yourself can be an act of, of liberation, of self-liberation. You know, you're ignoring laws and conventions and the sanctity of property. Um, and you're, like, actually doing this yourself. And you're not getting, you're not trying to get somebody else to do it. You're not getting the government to do it. There's a lot of big differences. And, of course, well, the thing about the government we'll get to in a minute. <clears throat> it is this Robin Hood fantasy, or taking from the rich to give to the poor, that has caused the most pain for the poor and the middle class. Well, we'll see. The reason the middle class is so heavily taxed is because of the Robin Hood ideal. That's partly true. Let's, let's go a little further. The reality is that the rich are not taxed. It's the middle class, especially the educated upper income middle class, who pays for the poor. 
Yeah, but also the poor have to pay for themselves. Let's not pretend otherwise. I mean, everybody's, first of all, everybody's paying in taxes, okay? Everybody. Even if your income is so low that you don't pay any income taxes, well, everything is is part of the market. Everything has been commodified, so you still have to pay taxes on everything you buy. Um, so they're still taxed very much. And I mean, even, you know, to the extent that they're not directly taxed, just the fact that government exists to dominate them, I mean, that's a lot worse than just a tax, you know, depending, like, how taxes are levied. Again, to understand fully how things happen, we need to look at the history of taxes. Okay, but he's not really looking at the history of taxes, he's looking at a few events. Rich Dad explained to Mike and me that originally, in England and America, there were no taxes. Origi occasionally, there were temporary taxes levied in order to pay for wars. Yeah, sort of. Although there were also tariffs. Um, early, the early United States had a lot of tariffs, and of course, um, Britain around that time was mer mercantilist. So, you know, you can read about that, but I mean, no taxes? Like, no, just no income taxes. Not all taxes are income taxes. Um, the king or president would put the word out and ask everyone to chip in. Taxes were levied in Britain for the fight against Napoleon from 1799 to 1816, and in America to pay for the Civil War from 1861 to 1865. Uh, I mean, again, I'm not an expert on this. I'm sure the dates are right, but there's, there's got to be more to it than that. In 1874, England made income tax a permanent levy on its citizens. In 1913, an income tax became permanent in the United States with the adoption of the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. At one time, Americans were anti-tax. <laughs> it had been the tax on tea that led to the famous Tea Party in Boston Harbor, an incident that helped ignite the Revolutionary War. It took approximately 50 years in both England and the United States to sell the idea of a regular income tax. What these historical dates fail to reveal is that both of these taxes were initially levied only against the rich. It was this point that the rich dad, that rich dad wanted Mike and me to understand. He explained that the idea of taxes was made popular and accepted by the majority by telling the poor and the middle class that taxes were created only to punish the rich. Okay. I don't know if, um, I, I don't remember anyone ever, like, telling us that taxes were created to punish the rich and redistribute wealth. I think you'd have trouble selling that as, as a historical event. Um, but there's no doubt that a lot of people in the poor and middle class see taxes as they hopefully see taxes you know they they look at taxes as this possible way of constraining the rich and and uh, getting a bit more of their enormous pie and uh, and and Robert Kiyosaki's going to explain that that's not really how it works and that part I agree with <laughs> Um, this is how the masses voted for the law. Whoa, 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 whoa. I beg your pardon? The masses voted for the law? Masses vote on laws now? Huh. I think you're mistaking the uh, government for a democracy. <laughs> Where, like, people might actually have a say in things. What, what is this nonsense? The masses voted for the law. The masses do not vote for laws. You mean, like, symbolically, by approving of it? That you don't even know. Because we, you know, when you never ask the masses if they consent to anything that's done to them from on high, then, like, you don't know if they voted for it or if they would vote for it. If they actually had their own choices, they might not do the thing that, that you think that they did. And, some, and, and you can't just vote for a law and it becomes constitutionally legal. That's not how that works. But whatever. Although it was intended to punish the rich? What? It was? What? Who says?
What are you talking about? In reality, it wound up punishing the very people who voted for it. What, the politicians? The poor, oh, the poor in the middle class, right, who didn't vote for it. I mean, I mean, there was a lot going on in the United States at this time. Um, and there's a whole, there's a whole thing behind it. Like there's, you can learn all kinds of, of history about these things. I, I don't really think, um, you know, like intending to punish the rich was ever the point of the income tax. Not at any point, you know? And it won't be. It can't be. It can't be. In fact, Rich Dad kind of explains why it doesn't. Let's see, where are we? Once government got a taste of money, its appetite grew. <laughs> okay. Right. Government only grew because it really, like, like, no, government will always grow in every direction if it can. Because government represents power. Um, the more areas of life it can take over, the more deeply it can be embedded in that level, uh, you know, le like area of life, the, th its appetite for more power is going to grow. That's how it works. That's how it grows. Like, yeah, of course, it's always trying to take more money. And it does, because even though, even when taxes don't go up, and they tend to go up because there's always, like, a new tax introduced on this and that. There's, like, so many different taxes. Um, but, um, like, even, even when they aren't introduced for a long time, if the economy grows at all, um, revenues are going to grow. Government revenues are going to grow, so they're going to do more, you know? And, and if it has an inch, then it can take a mile. Your dad and I are exactly opposite. He's a government bureaucrat and I'm a capitalist. We get paid and our success is measured on opposite behaviors. He gets paid to spend money and hire people. Yeah, that's true. The more he spends and the more people he hires, the larger his organization becomes. That's effectively true, yeah, in, in government. Um, and it, because it's, it's a very strange incentive structure in a lot of government systems, I mean, I mean, you probably know about it, but like, um, like, uh, like it, like at the university, the, a lot of the university departments and budgets, like they kind of had to spend all of their budget or else their budget would get reduced, you know? Um, so of course it's extremely inefficient that way because, you know, the incentive of the department and the department head is to spend all their money, even if they don't need it, Right. So that's that incentive. Then you've got, on the other hand, within my organization, the fewer people I hire and the less money I spend, the more respected I am by my investors. Okay, yeah, so there's that. So, so they're kind of rewarded for efficiency. But of course, efficiency in business often means laying off like tons and tons of people, which means destroying their livelihood. That's why I don't like government people. They have different objectives than most business people. Yeah, well, there are reasons not to like business people for their objectives, though. <laughs> As the government grows, more and more tax dollars are needed to support it. Mm -hmm. My educated dad sincerely believed that government should help people. He loved John F. Kennedy and especially the idea of the Peace Corps. He loved the idea so much that both he and my mom worked for the Peace Corps, training volunteers to go to Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines. He's always strived for additional grants and budget increases so he could hire more people, both in his job with the education department and in the Peace Corps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you kind of need to. In academia or, or the bureaucracy, you kind of need to always be asking for grants and budget increases and more employees and stuff. I mean, yeah, like you can criticize the incentive structure. I would criticize a lot of things about those things, but, um, but yeah, that is very much how it works. Um, from the time I was about 10 years old, I would hear from my rich dad that government workers were a pack of lazy thieves. Like, as if lazy means anything at all coming from a rich dad. Or, or lazy thieves. It doesn't mean anything coming from a rich person. Like, rich people are, are people who, like, 
you know, with things like land or their products or their sir anything that they sell, they've stolen it first and then said, now this is mine and no one else is allowed to have access to it unless they pay me, right? Like it requires theft, all business, all markets, the, the things that were commodified, that were, that were, that became part of a market, all had to be stolen from the people first. See? But, but, but if you don't acknowledge that aspect of history, then, um, then you, you can ignore it. You can be like, oh, those people are thieves. Robin Hood is a thief. Even though I own everything, you know, um, if you try to take any of it, you're a thief. Well, maybe thieves are the good guys now. And lazy? I mean, again, rich people don't have to work at all. Or to the extent they do work, I mean, as rich as this, as Kiyosaki's basically telling you, what they do is they, they work on their own, like, balance sheets. They work on their asset columns. They manage their corporations and their business empire. That's the work they do. Their work is just managing money and, and seeing how they can get more of it. So, lazy thieves? Get the fuck out of here. From my poor dad, I would hear how the rich were greedy crooks who should be made to pay more taxes. Like that would. Both sides had valid points. Uh, do they? I don't know if either of them do. It was difficult to go to work for one of the biggest capitalists in town and come home to a father who was a prominent government leader. Yeah, except that, I mean, government exists to serve the capitalists. And, and capitalism exists because the state has created it. The the, you, you paint these people as opposites, just like people who paint liberals and conservatives as opposites. They think that, oh, they're, com they're completely different. They're as far away as they possibly can. No, you're two sides of the same coin. They, they're both necessary parts of capitalism. I'm saying capitalism's bad. Yet, when you study the history of taxes, an interesting perspective emerges. Uh, yeah, you gotta study it, though. Not just listen to Kiyosaki. As I said, the passage of taxes was only possible because the masses believed in the Robin Hood theory of economics. Take from the rich and give to everyone else. No, who, who says? How do you know? Who says they said that? Is that how it was sold to them? Maybe it wasn't even sold to them. Like, like the state, like laws and taxes, people don't ask for them. They don't ask permission. They go, this is what you're paying now from now on. And if you got a problem with it, you can go to jail. So they don't need to be sold that. I think they were sold that line over time, over the 20th century. But then it did kind of do that in the 20th century because... Um, and, and, you, and again, you won't hear this from rich people, but thanks to the agitation of leftists like, like anarchists and, and trade unionists and other kinds of socialists, um, like thanks to major um, agitation, agitating for a revolution in like the 20s and 30s, finally they voted in a government that would actually, you know, like take more from the rich. I mean, it didn't exactly take much from the rich, but, um, you know, at least take a bit more and give lots more to the people. So it kind of created a bunch of jobs and, uh, you know, like introduced all these programs. I'm not sure which ones exactly, but at least they like helped out, um, you know, helped out some people, right? They kind of stopped people stopped a lot of people from going into the most desperate poverty, right? At least they kind of did something. I, I'm, I hate government more than most people that, that you'll ever meet, but that's not to say that it, it can't slightly reduce inequality. It could, theoretically. It has done, right? <clears throat> Uh, the problem was that the government's appetite for money was so great, the taxes soon need to, needed to be leveled on the middle class. 
And from there, it kept trickling down. That's a good way to put it. However, the rich saw an opportunity because they don't play by the same set of rules. The rich knew about corporations, which became popular in the days of sailing ships. The rich created the corporation as a vehicle to limit their risk to the assets of each voyage. The rich put their money into a corporation to finance the voyage. The corporation would then hire a crew to sail to the new world to look for treasure. Yeah, I mean, that's basically true. That's where the corporation comes from. If the ship was lost, the crew lost their lives, but the loss to the... Let's not worry about that. <laughs> but the loss to the rich would be limited only to the money they invested for that particular voyage. <laughs> this diagram that follows... I mean, you can look at his diagrams. They... I don't know. They're kind of confusing. Um, even if you've read Chapter 2, which has a lot of them, it's still a bit confusing. Um... So anyway, this there's a lot of truth to what to that last paragraph that that's uh, that's kind of the whole purpose of the corporation, and um, and and that's what happened for quite a while. And then, but around the time of the income tax, they had they they were still of course they were still using corporations, but they had also discovered the foundation. Um, what, what was the name of the book? The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, I think is where I got this from. But anyway, um, check that book out. Um, it's, you know, they, they say a lot about how foundations and the beginning of what became NGOs was really um, a way for the rich to kind of launder even more money, you know? Um, because, you know, everything that, you know, everything was kind of owned by the corporation, but still, then they could still get, you know, it would still, some of the money would, would have to go to the individuals and their incomes. And so to uh, lower their tax burden and, and go into a smaller tax bracket, um, they would set up foundations, nonprofits, where... Um, you know, they, sometimes they were helping the poor, but I mean, that's not the only thing they did with that money. They did a lot of, like, most of it was very self-serving, and the whole purpose of it was to reduce the amount they paid in taxes. And I don't think he's going to talk about that in this chapter, but it is a key element to how the rich, you know, don't pay any of the taxes. It's the knowledge of the legal and corporate structure that really gives the rich a vast advantage over the poor and the middle class. Okay, I mean, yes, but if you're poor or middle class, you can't just learn those things and become rich. The real advantage that the rich have is that they have all the money. <laughs> they learn about the, the legal, they le learn about laws and, and how corporations work to, to keep their money and to expand it. So, I mean, that's, that's one way of putting it, but, I mean, come on. Then there's this hilarious sentence. Having two fathers teaching me, one a socialist and the other a capitalist. Whoa, 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 whoa. A socialist? Your father was not a socialist unless he was very confused. Let's, let's go back here. My educated dad sincerely believed that government should help people. Not necessarily a socialist belief. It's very widespread. But let us let me just remind you of this sentence. He loved John F. Kennedy, and especially the idea of the Peace Corps. There's no way a socialist, like a real socialist, would love John F. Kennedy, the president of a capitalist state. And the idea of the Peace Corps which is kind of the soft imperialist arm of the capitalist state. I mean, again, you could be a very confused socialist and not realize any of those things, but, I mean, socialism isn't just uh, raise taxes or <laughs> create social programs, something like that. I, in fact, just, just going to Wikipedia, if, if you don't know what it is, if you thought that's what socialism is, just go to Wikipedia. Just look at, like, the first couple of paragraphs. You'll see how wrong you always were. It's nothing to do with, with that. In fact, it's very little to do with government, really. It's not about government. Ultimately, socialism aims to get rid of government, because government 
uh, well, as Marx once said, government is the the uh, what was it, the organizing body or something of the ruling class. Um, I think it's a bit more than that, but um, but it's one way to think of it. Now, where are we? Um, so, socialist? No, he's not a socialist. But I began to realize that the philosophy of the capitalist made more financial sense to me. Yeah, to you. <laughs> because if your goal and purpose is to make money for yourself, then obviously you're going to believe in capitalism. If you're like me and you care about things like fairness and freedom and everybody getting by rather than just a few people who already have all the money, then maybe you'd look into socialism. Now, I don't usually call myself a socialist, but I am an anarchist, which, you know, is really a kind of socialism. So, uh, so yes, look into those things. I mean, hey, it's up to you. If all you care about is your own wealth, then great. Then, then read this book without a critical eye like I did and uh, just do everything it says. Great. But um, you will be one of the few because there's no way that just everybody who reads this book can just become an elite <laughs> part of the ruling class. Like, it just doesn't work that way. It's impossible. It seemed to me that the socialists ultimately penalized themselves due to their lack of financial education. Oh god, this song again. He's always singing this song. It's just financial education. If you, if you socialists just learned some accounting or had some investments, then, you know, you, you would no longer believe in freedom and... Uh, and, and justice for all and so on. You would you would just care about, you know, your own money and, and that kind of thing. Like, yeah, right. Lack of financial education. Like, they, I mean, we're still, I, I have the feeling that he would talk about basic economics because, you know, all of these like right-wingers and libertarians are always like, learn basic economics. And like a lot of socialists are onto the advanced economics, having learned and debunked all the basic nonsense. No matter what the take from the rich crowd came up with, the rich always found a way to outsmart them. This is actually important to know for, for any leftists or would-be revolutionaries. This is actually quite accurate, as we can tell. I mean, you can see from the world today. It's quite, quite accurate. Um, whenever someone has said... Um, we should be trying to take from the rich and give to the poor, but, you know, in like a civilized way, using the government in a legal and polite and, and civilized way, the, they always get screwed. They always get screwed. The rich always uh, find a way around those taxes. Again, corporations, foundations, donations, um, you know, like offshore banks, obviously. I mean... And, 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 you know, every, every election cycle, they start talking about like, oh, we need to, we need to rein in, you know, offshore bank accounts and start taxing that. And every election cycle, people are disappointed because they don't, they don't remember anything and they don't, you know, they can't remember past two years ago because they watched so much news and think that everything on the news is vital and new and accurate. And so, of course... They think that you can just raise taxes and and on the rich and the, the rich will now have to pay for all these social programs that you envision. Please stop envisioning them. Please stop believing in this, in this nonsense. It will never happen. It doesn't work that way. Like, I, I just hate that that I have to fight with leftists on this, that, that they just believe out of hope with no real history behind it, that, that one day, you know, the, the right politician will be voted in and they'll raise taxes on the rich and that'll solve like so many, it'll solve our infrastructure problem, it'll wipe out poverty and homelessness. No, it won't. Even if you could get the rich to pay way more in taxes, the government doesn't work that way. Look at its budget. 
Look at what its budget actually is. That's its priorities. You'll you'll see that like something like wiping out homelessness is not one of those priorities. You know, it's not anywhere in their budget, right? And it doesn't just like like suddenly it's not going to just suddenly become like Sweden or or something just because it has more money. It's going to have the same priorities. It's just going to give more money to the military and more money to the police and obviously to contractors i mean that's where that money goes i just think it's exceedingly naive to think you can you can like reduce the power of the rich or or alleviate the suffering of the poor by like taxing the rich it just seems exceedingly naive to me but hey you know keep trying if you really believe in it whatever it's your thing but I will not be supporting you. And that's how taxes were eventually levied on the middle class. Because the rich are smarter. I mean, sort of, yeah. The rich outsmarted the intellectuals solely because they understood the power of money. A subject not taught in school. Solely? No, they already had all the money. <laughs> like, everybody understands the power of money. But to say that solely, you know, they just, they understood something about money. And that's why pe the people with all the money kept all the money. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. No. I mean, shit, the government def protects them and defends them. The government works for them. Understand the power of money. They have, they have like coercive power behind their money. It's not because they understood the power of money. It's because their, they had all the money and their money had power. How did the rich outsmart the intellectuals? Well, they haven't. They just, they just have ways of uh, avoiding taxes. Once the take from the rich tax had passed, was passed, cash started flowing into government coffers. Initially, people were happy. Money was hand handed out to government workers and the rich. It went to government workers in the form of jobs and pensions and went to the rich via their factories receiving government contracts. The government received a large pool of money, but the problem was the fiscal management of that money. The government ideal is to avoid having excess money. If you fail to spend your allotted funds, you risk losing it in the next budget. You would certainly not be recognized for being efficient. Business people, on the other hand, are rewarded for having excess money and are applauded for their efficiency. Yeah, I mean, you said that already. He's very repetitive in this book, unfortunately. Um, and I mean, yeah, that that's all true. But that's a, all a question of incentives. That's how the system works. And he never mentions that. As this cycle of growing government spending continued, the demand for money increased and the tax the rich idea was adjusted to include lower income levels, down to the very people who voted it in, the poor and middle class. Again, I don't remember the vote, but whatever. True capitalists used their financial knowledge to simply find an escape. They headed back to the protection of a corporation. What many people who've never formed a corporation don't know is that a corporation's not really a thing. I think they probably do know that. And I think, uh, and I think everybody in my generation learned it because of the, the documentary, The Corporation, that we all saw 20 years ago. A corporation is merely a file folder with some legal documents in it, sitting in some attorney's office and registered with a state government agency. It's not a big building or a factory or a group of people. A corporation is merely a legal document that creates a legal body without a soul. Using it, the wealth of the rich was once again protected. It was popular because the income tax rate of a corporation is less than the individual income tax rates. Okay, but then, there you go. That's, that's government. That's because... Government has made it that way for the rich, right? Because the rich control the state, they go, okay, but we're going to own corporations, so our income is way, you know, is taxed at much lower levels. In addition, certain expenses could be paid by a corporation with pre-tax dollars. If you don't understand that, don't worry, we'll, uh, we'll understand it in a minute. We'll learn it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's all basically true. But so what? This war between the haves and have-nots has raged for hundreds of years. Uh, hundreds. Thousands! 
it has raged since the first, you know, proto-states formed like 7,000 years ago in places like China and Mesopotamia. There were always people fighting back against that. Always like it's, and it's, you could call it like early class struggle. The battle is waged whenever and wherever laws are made and it will go on forever. Well, it'll only go on forever if we can't solve this problem and rectify it. Destroy the system and its capacity for making people, you know, take things for themselves and getting rich off them. The problem is that people who lose are the uninformed, the ones who get up every day and diligently go to work and pay taxes. If they only understood the way the rich play the game, they could play it too. Yeah, but... Yes, but it's not about that. Because it doesn't... You, you say that as if, like, the un... All you have to do is kind of inform yourself. That if... It, and it's just... Everybody would inform themselves. Then they'd all get rich. They'd all be able to be rich. They'd all be up there at the top. No, of course not. It's impossible. Not everybody can be rich. There's only like a few people, basically. A very tiny percentage of the population could ever be rich. That's how it works. Like, it's, it's impossible to do otherwise. Like, think about it this way. If you, if you were really rich, then who, who's working for you? Because, as we learned in the last chapter, rich people... Like, they have many sources of passive income. We didn't use that term. There's all kinds of passive income, which means they just get it because other people are working. Other people are working at the businesses that you own, you know? And that's why your investments can grow. That's why they can pay off. But, you know, if everyone was rich, then there'd be nobody to work in, in those businesses would they because we'd be like oh well i'm rich i don't need that i don't need a job <laughs> so who would work for the rich people so of course they would never get rich in the first place if nobody was there to work for them so they need poor people they need a, a, a huge mass a labor force that they can just you know take from whenever they want so like they could play the game too the poor could just just play the game? No, sorry. Doesn't work that way. Then they would be on their way to their own financial independence. Yeah, everyone can just be financially independent in a system that requires labor. <laughs> no, I don't think so. This is why I cringe every time I hear a parent advise their children to go to school so they can find a safe, secure job. An employee with a safe, secure job without financial aptitude has no escape. Well, that's true. But then none of us really have escape from this system anyway, do we? That's why we have to overturn it so we can escape it. Average Americans today work four to five months for the government just to cover their taxes. Um, I think there are some studies that find this. I haven't looked at them, but I expect it's pretty accurate. Four or five months just to cover their taxes. In my opinion, that's simply too long. Google the abolition of work. One month is too long. Any work is too much. Okay? Look it up. The abolition of work. We should be abolishing work as we know it. They shouldn't be working four or five months. They shouldn't be working. In my opinion, that's simply too long. Well, what exactly informs your opinion? The harder you work, the more you pay the government. Well, that's not really true. I'd say the harder you work, the more your boss gets. Like... Like, does he think that everybody's job rewards them based on how hard they work? There's not many jobs like that. That's why I believe that the idea of take from the rich backfired on the very people who voted it in. In that, in that referendum, remember? <laughs> Every time people try to punish the rich, the rich don't simply comply. They react. They have the money, power, and intent to change things. 
They don't just sit there and voluntarily pay more taxes. Instead, they search for ways to minimize their tax burden. They hire smart attorneys and accountants and persuade politicians to create laws or create legal loopholes. They use their resources to effect change that benefits themselves. Let's point that out. And yeah, that's that's true. And again, that's part of this whole thing, part of the reason why I don't think um, you should be trying to get them to pay all the taxes because they'll just create new laws and loopholes. Like, like if you have... Like, if you can afford a team of accountants, then you base, in effect, you know all the loopholes. You know all the different, uh, like, all the tricks. Or, you know, the people who work for you know all the tricks, right? Um, and, and, and lawyers and stuff like that. Like, if you're rich, you can afford teams. You can afford to hire, like, all the, the, the most powerful firms in these industries. Right? And of course, same with lobbyists, and lobbyists help to change the laws and the tax codes. Um, this is this next paragraph is just an example um, of like because because uh, there's so many of them, um, really. But this one is just section one o three one allows a seller to delay paying taxes on a piece of real estate that's sold for a capital gain through an exchange for a more expensive piece of real estate. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's that's basically the whole thing. That's what he's talking about. The poor and middle class just don't have the same resources. They sit there and let the government's needles enter their arm and allow the blood donation to begin. Well, it's not a donation. It's forced. Today, I'm constantly shocked at the number of people who pay more taxes or take fewer deductions simply because they're afraid of the government. Yeah, I know. How could you be afraid of the government? They've only got all the guns. <laughs> I have friends who, who've had their business shut down and destroyed only to find out it was a mistake on the part of the government. Oh my god. I mean, how fucked up is that? I realize all that. But the price of working from January to May is a high price for, to pay for that intimidation. My poor dad never fought back. My rich dad didn't either. He just played the game smarter. And he did it through corporations. The biggest secret of the rich. Okay, now, let me see if I can understand all this. Because, see, he doesn't... He never really gives a kind of... A critique of the system itself... And that's, that's where my problem lies. Because, of course, as a rich dad, he benefits immensely from this system. So he doesn't want you questioning it beyond this limited criticism that he offers. He says correctly that the rich tend to pay very little in taxes relative to their wealth. So if the poor and middle class pay for government, but government is good and we need it, then that must be the right way. You know, that must, that must be the way things are supposed to be. The poor and middle class are supposed to pay for all these things. He's not saying we should get rid of government. He's not saying we should reduce taxes or whatever. He's just saying that, you know, the, the poor and middle class should continue to pay for it. Um, that, you know, <laughs> that, but, that, um, but that you might, you can join it, you know. You can, you can join us in not paying taxes once you get super rich. This actually all reminds me of reading Elite Theory in grad school. I think it was Mosca, Gaetano Mosca, who said basically said something like, yeah, the elite control everything and the rest pay for it. That's how it should be. They've created this awesome system for ruling the people that benefits the people. So, yeah, right. So, so they deserve all the benefits of it. It's just in this book, Robert is showing how that lucky few can join the elite. You may remember the first lesson I learned from my rich dad. It was a little boy of nine who had to sit and wait for him to choose to talk to me. I sat in his office waiting for him to get to me. He was ignoring me on purpose. He wanted me to recognize his power and to desire to have that power for myself one day. Okay, maybe now you understand why I think we should destroy systems of power. Why we should tear down 
any any concentration of power at all because this is a perfect example why and why why do i have to recognize his power why what the hell is the point of that because he has power and he wants you to acknowledge it that's it and desire to have that power for yourself one day why why the power to make people wait for you because you're an asshole is that the point of power like what the hell like like i don't think anybody should have that power oh you can just make me wait and and you don't have to apologize because you're rich and you're a busy man well fuck you then what the fuck during all the years I studied and learned for him, he always reminded me that knowledge is power. Well, okay, is it knowledge or is it making people wait for you? Because they have to. And with money becomes great power that requires the right knowledge to keep it and make it multiply. I mean, that's all true. Without that knowledge, the world pushes you around. Rich Dad constantly reminded Mike and me that the biggest bully was not the boss or the supervisor, but the tax man. I beg your pardon? You see the tax man, what, once a year? And uh, if you're rich, you don't have to see him at all. Your accountants can see him. So I don't, you know, what the hell are you talking about? Not the boss? Trust me, boys. It's not the boss. It's not me. I'm not a bully. I'm only teaching you. Sure, I make people wait for me for no reason. Because I have that power, but I'm not the bully. The guy taking from me is the only real bully. <laughs> Please. The first lesson of having money work for you, as opposed to working for money, is all about power. If you work for money, you give the power to your employer. If money works for you, you keep the power and control it. Yeah. If you're rich, you have the power. Yeah. <laughs> so profound <laughs> once we had this knowledge of the power of money working for us he wanted us to be financially smart and not let anyone or anything push us around if you're ignorant it's easy to get bullied true if you know what you're talking about you have a fighting chance true that's why he paid so much for smart tax accountants and attorneys it was less expensive to pay them to, than to pay the government yeah well exactly I mean, we're, again, we're, we're learning all these secrets of the rich that prove that the system is totally geared towards the rich. And, but like, obviously, but again, we need it. It has to exist. So the poor have to keep paying for it. Um, his best lesson to me was be smart and you won't be pushed around as much. He knew the law because he was a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> And because it was expensive to not know the law. I mean, that's that's part of the problem, being a law-abiding citizen. I mean, for first of all, he probably wasn't. It's almost impossible to really follow the law, as I say in my video about the law, which you can read, uh, look at if you want. But, um, and, and it is very expensive not to know the law, but nobody really knows the law and follows all the laws. It's impossible. Just like nobody really believes in the law, because nobody, nobody tries that hard to follow the law. Um, but uh, that's, I guess that's a different thing. But still, calling him a, a law-abiding citizen, it sounds like it's supposed to be a compliment. No, he's a, he's a good person. He's a law-abiding citizen. Well, I don't respect that. Following the law, when laws exist to empower the rich and punish the poor is not a virtue. If you know you're right, you're not afraid of fighting back. Even if you're taking on Robin Hood and his band of merry men. No, wait, hang on, no. You were talking about the government, the tax collectors. They are not Robin Hood. You can't just conflate those two. They're so different. The government and the tax collectors are working for you, the rich. <laughs> like the Robin Hood thing is a fantasy of of liberals and social democrats. Like there's no, no there is no Robin Hoodism in government. Sorry. 
My highly educated dad always encouraged me to land a good job with a strong corporation. He spoke of the virtues of working your way up the corporate ladder. Ugh. He didn't understand that by relying solely on a paycheck from a corporate employer, I would be a docile cow ready for milking. Yeah, I agree with all that. But when I told my rich dad of my father's advice, he only chuckled. Why not own the ladder? Was all he said. Why not take away the ladder and burn it down? And burn down the whole worthless building while you're at it? <laughs> Like, why own own the ladder? Why is there a ladder? Why is it a good thing that some people are, you know, way higher than, than others, making all the decisions and getting all the money for it? And that all you, you, and they, they're the ones who have to accept you to enter, like, the next level that, you know, <laughs> like... Why, yeah, why not own the ladder? Like, yeah, great idea. Really, there should be no ladder. There should be no ladder. There shouldn't be corporations. There doesn't need to be hierarchy. These things are all just, just myths that the rich have created. And what Kiyosaki's doing is kind of reinforcing them, giving them a new sheen. You know, why not just own the ladder? As a young boy, I didn't understand what Rich Dad meant by owning my own corporation. It was an idea that seemed impossible and intimidating. Although I was excited by the idea, my inexperience wouldn't let me envision the possibility that grown-ups would someday work for a company I would own. So? The point is that if not for my Rich Dad, I would probably have followed my educated dad's advice. It was merely the occasional reminder of my Rich Dad that kept the idea of owning my own corporation alive and kept me on a different path. I mean, yeah, basically, like, it's it's good advice if you're going to own a bunch of assets and stuff, or, um, or maybe if you're going to be an independent contractor, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, uh, have your own corporation, because it's, like he said, it's harder for them to touch you legally um, and financially. If you're, if you're wrapped yourself in a corporation. By the time I was 15 or 16, I, I knew I wasn't going to continue down the path my educated dad recommended. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I was determined not to head in the direction most of my classmates were heading. That decision changed my life. Well, what if you had, you know, told some of your classmates? What if you had worked together a bit? You know, you might have been able to um, make a cooperative instead of just your own corporation that you use to own land. What if they had uh, come together and started a cooperative? You could do that. They could have done that. They wouldn't even have needed to go to university, although they probably still would have. Well, just an idea. It wasn't until my mid-twenties that my rich dad's advice began to make more sense for me. I was just out of the Marine Corps and working for Xerox. I was making a lot of money, but every time I looked at my paycheck, I was disappointed. The deductions were so large, and the more I worked, the greater they became. Yeah, I mean, you only look at deductions. You don't consider how much of the value of, uh, that you create actually gets taken by the employer, taken by the corporation, and by the higher-ups, and given to shareholders. Um, or maybe you knew and you didn't care. As I became more successful, my bosses talked about promotions and raises. It was flattering, but I could hear my rich dad asking in my ear, who are you working for? Who are you making rich? And those are good questions to keep in mind. <laughs> like, yeah, I certainly ask those questions. Um, well, let's keep going. In 1974, while still an employee for Xerox, I formed my first corporation and began minding my own business. There were already a few assets in my asset column already. But now I was determined to focus on making it bigger. Those paychecks with all the deductions made all the years of my rich dad's advice make total sense. So, um, yeah, like he's, he's going like, okay, now I'm going to start, you know, now I'm going to like focus on my 
corporation and my asset column full time, you know? And that's cool for you, and most people can't do that. Most people are not the top salesperson for Xerox, you know, making making that kind of money. Like that was the kind of money that, you know, a middle class family could buy a house on, you know? Um and 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 which is why not, you know, it's not really a very widespread opportunity anymore. You know, so it's cool. And besides, this was the 70s. Like, like of course, he doesn't really acknowledge, or at least not in this book that I remember, he doesn't really acknowledge that the economy has changed a lot. A hell of a lot. Including the fact that so-called jobs for life no longer exist. And, you know, even the, the things that used to be jobs for life, they don't pay for things like houses and cars and, and 2.4 kids anymore. All right. Many employers feel that advising their workers to mind their own business is bad for business. But for me, focusing on my own business and developing assets made me a better employee because I now had a purpose. I came in early and worked diligently, amassing as much money as possible so I could invest in real estate. Hawaii was just set to boom, and there were fortunes to be made. So again, it's, 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 it's a lot of luck. He, he was making a lot of money at the right time. You know, at the time when Hawaii was set to boom, there's a lot of timing, a lot of market timing involved. And that's a very kind of precarious, um, like, step to put yourself on, uh, to, to kind of try to time the market. And, and again, as I mentioned before, Hawaii is very colonized land, so really, like, He's just going to expand his holdings over what's yet another settler colony instead of, like, trying to rectify that. Um, blah, 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 Xerox machines. I wanted out of the rat race. In less than three years, I was making more in my real estate holding corporation than I was at Xerox. Yeah, because you just, because people have to pay you in rent. <laughs> yeah. If, if you have a bunch of tenants paying you rent... Of course you're making more money than just at a job. They're paying you from their jobs. What uh, what did you actually do, though? Because he'll say later in the book, like, he kind of, you know, he doesn't exactly manage them himself. He doesn't fix toilets and sinks and stuff. He gets other people to do them, right? So basically, he owns things and collects rent, and that's it. That's it. Like, yeah, natural. Of course you're going to make more money than at Xerox. Um, and the money I was making in my asset column in my own corporation was money working for me. Not me pounding on doors selling copiers. Well, it's tenants working for you. But yeah, let's not split hairs, right? My rich dad's advice made much more sense. Soon the cash flow for my properties was so strong that my housing bought me my first Porsche. Your tenants. Yeah. My company. Oh, sorry. My company. <laughs> but yeah, your tenants bought you your first Porsche. Go on. My fellow Xerox salespeople thought I was spending my commissions. I wasn't. I was investing my commissions in assets. My money was working hard to make more money. Each dollar in my asset column was a great employee, working hard to make more employees and buy the boss a new Porsche with before tax dollars. Again, every time you hear, like, a dollar in his asset column, imagine the employee that's actually doing the work. Because it's not him. The plan was working, and my Porsche was the proof. By using the lessons I learned from my rich dad, I was able to get out of the proverbial rat race at an early age. I was, it was made possible because of the strong financial knowledge I had acquired through rich dad's lessons. Uh, we'll call it financial intelligence or financial IQ and your road to financial independence. He's saying that financial IQ is made up of knowledge from four broad areas, accounting, investing, markets, and the law. Yeah, okay, so great. You can, you can know all those things. That's great. Um, go ahead. <laughs> If, if that's what you really want, if what you want is to get rich, then yeah, that's what you should do. Um, 
I've learned about, I don't know anything about accounting. I used to know a fair bit about investing because I used to invest <laughs> um, before I started critiquing all of these things. Um, and I made some money, you know, it's not that hard to do really, depending what you do. Um, like, I mean, again, like if you, if you just kind of bought a building and rented it out, I mean, you can, like, he's going to tell you, Kiyosaki's going to tell you that, like, it depends because you got to find the right place and you got to know, I don't know, you got to have the right people on staff and so on. But, like, but, like, it doesn't exactly, um, take, like, a, a, a huge amount of work. You just kind of buy stuff. <laughs> yeah, you got to learn about it, but then you just buy stuff. And then when, with the money that's coming in, you hire people who understand accounting and the law and that kind of thing, right? Um, corporations have tax advantages. Um, this is what I, I was going to mention before. You mentioned pre-tax dollars. The idea is that um, if you've got, I don't know why it's very exciting to learn about this field. I don't see why that's exciting at all. In fact, it seems very boring to me. And uh, that's presumably one reason that people are so reluctant to learn about it, but whatever. Um, a corporation earns, spends everything it can, and then is taxed on any, everything that's left. Um, so, your, so your vacations can be board meetings in Hawaii, car payments, insurance repairs, health club memberships can be company expenses, restaurant meals can be company expenses, and it's all done legally with pre-tax dollars. And yeah, that's that's important. In fact, even if you don't uh, do anything with your corporation, it might be good just to have one so that every time you eat out or, uh, you know, re repair, fix your car, that you can write it off <laughs> for your taxes. I mean, that's what rich people do. Or that's what anyone who owns a corporation does. So you, you could. <laughs> There's not much left in this chapter, so uh, we'll finish there.